Well, good morning and a very special welcome to all our visitors. This morning we're going to continue in our study in the book of 1 Peter. I've just been loving 1 Peter and what the Lord's been doing in our midst, and this morning we will continue. We're going to be in uh, chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 12 this morning. So as we begin, just by way of reminder, I just want to come back to why is Peter writing this letter? It was to a church that was being persecuted, and even they're on the, the eve of the Neronian persecu- persecution, which is going to be mighty and bring many deaths to those who, right now receiving this letter. And so what Peter wants to do is prepare them to endure it, to shine a light in a unique way in the midst of the persecution that they are facing. The light of Jesus Christ tends to be brighter in the midst of affliction and in the midst of pressure, and Peter's now preparing that. Peter desires that these saints would live different than their surrounding culture that hopes in the here and now. Their hope is in the present, and he's showing them, you have been born again to a living hope, and so we're to live different lives. In the face of the hostility of this world to Jesus Christ, we live and we respond in a way like no other. We love like no other, so that people will glorify God in the day of their visitation, which was the day when they were saved. They'll they'll, they'll glorify God because of the way you behaved when they were persecuting you. And they're going to ask you, what is the hope within you? You're different. You're hoping in something beyond this world. That is what Peter's going after, that we care about this lost generation. It's not just us. He's writing that we would go and shine lights so that they would be saved by our different behavior and our message about Jesus Christ. And so my burden and passion is that Southside Bible Church would live these kind of lives that are distinctly God-honoring, Christ-like lives so that many would be led to Christ by our example and by our testimony. And that is what Peter is calling us to, again, as a way of reminder This was the opposite of of Peter's natural man, what we saw at the beginning of this epistle when we studied Peter's life. Peter had a hangover, even as a believer, of that self-sufficiency. And he's now been broken, broken greatly as he went out and wept deeply after he betrayed Christ three times. And now Jesus Christ in John 21 restored him and said, feed my sheep and tend my lambs. And here he is now. Uh, feeding the sheep and tending these lambs who are on the eve of a very great persecution. And so what he's preaching, in a short time, he's going to be led by Nero to a cross in which he's going to humbly walk to, submitting to the government, and he's going to be asked to be crucified upside down because he's not worthy to be crucified in the way that his Savior was. His hope was in Christ, and I, I pray that we have hope for our own lives of what we've been learning to look at Peter and the power of the Holy Spirit and say, I can, I can become this kind of man or woman, what we're learning here in Peter. Because the Holy Spirit that dwells within us is mediating the presence and the power of Christ to conform us to these kind of people. And so I want to go before God and I want to pray and ask that we're not just studying the Bible, that we are looking at this to be transformed, to be these kind of people, that many would be saved by our lives and our testimony. So let's go to our God and ask that thing even this morning. Father, we realize there's a veil that's been torn in two, and we now come into your presence. We have full access, and we stand blameless with great joy this morning in the presence of Almighty God. Father, I thank you for what you've been revealing and teaching to us in this epistle. And I pray this morning that the truths that we're going to look at, Lord, that they would uh, metamorphose us into the image of Christ. For the verses we look at, Christ was the perfect example of what we will see. And, And I pray, God, that we would walk in his footsteps, empowered only by Jesus Christ in your spirit dwelling within us. Lord, do your work in our midst. Change us now. Let our our season in this word be worship. And may you be glorified. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you look at verse 8, last week we looked up this section that started back in 1 Peter 2.11, uh, chapter 3, verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, be sympathetic and brotherly and kind-hearted, 
and humble in spirit. This is what we call a pearl necklace, the five graces. These are attitudes that we're to have now toward one another in the body of Christ. Harmonious was to be like-minded. We have a like-mindedness on the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the spread of that gospel. We have a sympathy toward one another, and we are brotherly with the the bowels of our compassion, our kind-heartedness, and the chief grace of all that we're humble in spirit as we dwell together in this beautiful thing called the body of Christ with those graces. This morning, we're going to take up then what are our responses to ill treatment in verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And so the dangers that threaten our unity, our life together in verse 8, is when we start living the way God has called us to, that things are going to start happening. We're going to have some conflicts. Remaining sin will cause problems and a devil coming against the church of God. In verses 10 through 12, we'll look at as well. And now he's going to quote Psalm 34 that Robin read to you this morning and we prayed over to show that this has always been the teaching of Scripture. This is God's plan uh, from Old Testament to New Testament. I want to do something a little different this morning than I usually do, but I, I think it's going to help us in understanding the passage that's before us. I want to look first at verses 10 through 12, and then we're going to come back because they just feed into verse 9, and I think it will all unfold beautifully. So if you'll look with me in verse 10. This is what we call the good life, the one who desires life to love and see good days. Peter's quoting David, and he'll show us what is the good life. This is truly a a deeply embedded desire within every image bearer of God. We all come into this world wanting the good life. We spend all of our days looking for the good life. The church is full of people who are still looking for the good life through religion, and through many different ways. But Peter's going to tell us this morning, how do I find the good life? And it's not in the way that our world is going about finding it. How do I get the good life? What is the good life today? Marketers tell us it's sitting on a tropical beach with waves and the sun shining and a corona next to you, and you say, ah, the good life. We all continuously consciously and subconsciously think there's something that will give us the good life. And even in the quietness of your heart, is there something you keep looking for in your own heart saying, that's the good life, it's retirement. If I can just get to this place, I will find the good life. Not many think of the good life the way that Peter does and the way that David does in the text before us. It's funny that Peter's talking about the good life In a church that's suffering great persecution, they've been spread abroad throughout Cappadocia and Bithynia and all that area of Turkey. The whole letter is talking about the fiery ordeals that are among you. In 1 Peter 1, he talked about a fiery furnace that you're enduring. That doesn't sound like a corona commercial to me. Can we really have the good life amidst this fallen world and all the suffering that is around us and in us that we are facing? Can you have that good life this morning? Well, let me set the context of Psalm 34. David's fleeing around now, and he's writing this most likely from a cave. He's been cut off from the people of God. He's been cut off from his family. He's been cut off from the promises. Saul is trying to kill him. It was some very, very difficult days in the life of David, and he's talking about loving life and seeing good days. I would expect weeping and depression But he says, these are the good days. So quickly we see the world's view of the good life and God's appear to be in contradiction. And my prayer is that everyone in this room gets this message this morning that you will love life and you will see good days even if you suffer every one of those days while you're here on this earth. I think of Paul and Silas who've been imprisoned for preaching the gospel. They're in the stocks. Their backs have been split open from beatings, and they're singing praises until midnight because it had been a good day, suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. I think of Solomon who went after the good life, and he had the ability by God's providence to go to the highest level of every possibility to find the good life. And his conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12.1, remember also your creator in the days of your youth 
before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. I have no delight in I chased after the good life in the wrong way all of my life. I've wasted my life as he came to the end. So every heart wants the good life. We want our highest happiness and good. And it does not come from a beach with no care in the world, but it comes from a battleship. And while even being mistreated in our context and reviled and rejected, that's what we have before us, there's a way to have a good life in the midst of great persecution. And so I hope to unfold this morning the secret of the good life that every believing soul can have in Christ. Look with me in verse 10. For the one who desires life to love and see good days, he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit or guile. And so when, when being attacked and reviled, you're, you're being chased, you're being hunted down. He wants you to refrain, to hold back from your tongue, your tongue speaking evil and speaking guile against those who are persecuting you and mistreating you and maligning you from government to bosses to a husband. This often is our first weapon that we reach for when we're being mistreated is I will reach for my tongue and I will slander and I will come at you. We'll hurt you back with tongues and if I can't do it in person, I will do it behind your back. That's my weapon. That's how I respond to mistreatment. You want to see good days? Don't turn your tongue into a weapon of retaliation. Don't use your tongues in this way. And secondly, he says, let him turn away from evil and do good. This Hebrew word literally means to swerve. Let, let them swerve away from the evil and do good. It's, it's an evasive action. Turn away from evil. The desire to give evil back for evil. You're going to have that emotion well up within you. And he says, swerve from it. Turn from it. Don't come and revile and bring that back. Well, where, where should I go if I swerve from retaliation and coming after evil with evil? Where do I go? And then the psalmist says, do good. Turn, turn from evil and turn to do good. The active pursuit of doing good. Christ went about doing men good. That is what we are to be. Guys, that is the good life. The good life is someone who's been born again, crucified with Christ, and now the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I go about doing men good. That is the good life. I've been born again, and now my life is for you. It exists for you, and I'm going to go after how to do men good. That is the good life. The good life is doing good. What does the world and the devil tell us? They tell us to have good days, you must turn away from good, and you must do evil. If you're ever going to be happy, quit being a puritanical prude and turn to, to really the fun things of life. That's how you're going to find the good life. The good days is you need to leave that spouse of yours and run after the other woman. The good days are spend your days in retirement on you and not the good of others. Work your whole life so you can be selfish all the way to your grave. The good days are get out from under these rules of the church and your parents and go experience the good life and be like the prodigal eating pig slop at the end of it. The good life is being an elder and having position and status versus the good life of laying your life down to serve others. The good life is that job that's going to finally fulfill me. The good life is having a woman who will love me as much as I do. The <laughs> The good life is the absence of trials, and there's all these things that the, the enemy will lie to you and tell you what the good life is, and I want to stand against that this morning with the authority of the Word of God and say that is not the good life. Swerve from that. Turn from it and do good. Turn away from evil that tells you the good life has you as the center reference point. The good life has Jesus Christ at the center reference point of your life, and we are to walk in those footsteps. That's where you will find the good life. Well, David continues as Peter quotes him, and he says, then let him seek peace and pursue it. The, the word for seek, it's an intense kind of seeking. Peter's going to use it again in chapter 5, verse 8, where he says, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. A lion is not apathetic when it's about to kill. 
And he uses that word, be seeking after peace like the way a lion would after its kill. It's the same word used in Luke 2 when they, they went and Jesus was young and they, they realized they lost Jesus and it said they began seeking for him. As only a, a parent knows of a lost child, the way you seek after that lost child. I, I want you to seek like that after peace. Pursue it. It's the same word for persecution. Hunt, hunt it down. Go hard. Persecute after peace. Peace, the blessing that we are to come to this world and bring. We bring glad tidings of good news. Blessed are the peacemakers. The Greek word means those who bring truth to bear. We, we pursue peace by bringing truth to bear into relationships and ideas and separation from God. And so we hunt it down and we seek after peace. You want the good life? Pursue peace. Be that peacemaker with the gospel of peace in every relationship that you are in. Bring peace. The good life is not the one who is always in conflict with unbelievers and with believers around you. Your whole life is conflict. I just am a doctrinal genius and I can argue anyone to the floor. That is not the good life. That is not the good life. If all you have is conflict in your life, you're the problem. And Peter is saying that is not going to ever bring you peace. You're always going to be upset, angry, mad at who mistreated you, didn't do what you desired. You will live in a very disgruntled, uh, not good life. The good life is a peacemaker. And you pursue after it. And you bring gospel and truth and peace into all areas around you. And look with me in verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. So this is not um, the eyes of the Lord. It's not so much about judgment. It really carries the idea that this, just doing a study on this phraseology, it, it dealt more with the Lord's omniscience. It's the fact that He knows all things. Most, it's most often used about God's watchfulness over His people. He knows all things, and He's watching over His children. He's aware of every detail of your life. He, he's scanning everything with that omniscience. And he's saying he listens to the prayers of his children. The Greek word for prayer is supplication, entreaty, or petition. And so he hears, this, is, this would make sense, you're being persecuted. People are coming after you, they're maligning you, and you're crying out to God. You're supplicating, you're entreating, you're petitioning him. God, help me. Help me in this. You, you, I need you, God. And it says his eyes are upon you when you're being mistreated and you're suffering and you're struggling to give this kind of response that we're learning in Peter. And it says he will respond to our prayers. He'll respond to the evil and, and to live the way that we want to in this epistle. So the eyes of God are, are upon us and he sees and he cares and he'll, he'll help you to respond, to, to not revile in return, and to show kindness, and to pursue peace, and all these beautiful things. God is looking, and He cares, and He will hear your prayers to help you be these kind of men, women, and children. The good life. The good life is that the Lord is watching over you to meet your every need. You don't have to take vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. He says, you could the good life, I'll give you the ability to calmly endure it without, he says, fear and frustration because the Lord is ready to heed your cry. Isn't that help you to, to endure mistreatment, that there's a God who, who will help you? He sees, he cares, he'll give you the grace at the time of need to respond this way. It, it almost lets me relax and I don't have to fight these battles. God is for me and he's, he's, his eyes are on me and he's ready to help in these battles. And verse 12, though, on the other hand, the not good life, he says, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The, the face of the Lord now, this is most often used to refer to judgment. So the eyes of the Lord are His omniscience, and the face of the Lord is judgment. I, I think of Christ hanging on that cross when the Father pulls out His sword of justice, and He cries out, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it says in the Greek, it was prostheos, they were face to face. And so now, here it is, it's face to face in the judgment of Almighty God, His Father, against Him on that cross. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 
So go ahead and live in retaliation all of your days. Be, be angry all the time and slander and, and, and sl- uh, have guile and insult other people. And what you lose is you lose the good life, not the blessing of God uh, for you, but the curse. You now have a God who's opposed to the proud. He is going to stand against you. Guys, this is the cancer of the soul, to be embittered and to live this way. It's a bad life. I've counseled it. I've watched it. I've had seasons of living it. It's not a good life. It, it will slowly deteriorate all of your being, becoming embittered against a wife, coming embittered against a workmate, someone in your college. You know, just you become embittered, and that isn't the good life that uh, Peter's writing about. The good life is in whatever difficulty or attack that comes against you. Is simply this: if God is for us, who could be against us? If you could just get that. And live into that. If God is for us, which He is, child of God, who could ever do anything that could ultimately harm you or hurt you? They're all puppets in the will of God, working and fashioning and shaping you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the good life, to come and to rest and surrender in that beautiful place. Do you see that the good life, please hear this, it's not in your circumstances going according to your plan. And it's not to get rid of pressures and squeezings in the beach. Guys, that is not the good life. The good life is having the good one. It's having the best one, loving and caring for you in the midst of all of life and all of its persecutions and all of its trials. The good life is to be a child of God, safe in the hand of God. Amen? All right, well, let's try to tie this all together then. Uh, verses 8 through 12 of all, it's one section, and I know I've broken it up a couple weeks, so I want to try to bring it all back together because I, I love verse 8, and I got uh, so much fun studying that last week and seeing the beauty of what verse 8 calls us to and praying for them and wanting to have those attitudes in the body of Christ. It's just, it's beautiful. But what happens then when somebody in that beautiful body wrongs us? What happens if someone slanders us? What happens when you got the know-it-all in your midweek who just keeps interrupting the teacher every time and you just came to learn and you're just tired of it? What happens when someone doesn't agree with my answer? Yeah, I, I don't agree with you. You can't say that. What if someone walks by you and says nothing? Or what if they say something and you wish they had said nothing? What if someone mistreats you? What if they have a different conscience issue? What if your spouse blows up at you or, or just someone says that thing that, 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 that they know will really hurt you? What happens to my attitudes then? Because we all love verse 8. We applaud it. We clap it. Yes. And now it's going to be challenged with this. What happens? You see, because if we have these midweeks, and I want to encourage you to keep plugging into those. I love what God's doing in them. We're being the body to each other. What God says, the body causes the growth of the body, and our gifts are coming together, and we're growing as a result of it. Discipleship is prospering. It brings a danger. And what is that? It's sin. Because the body of Christ is this little incubator with the sunshine and water to to grow us in our intimate relationships. And it's beautiful, but it's much easier to just do church where it's a building and you walk in, you sing, you hear a sermon and you go home and then you come back next week. It's a lot easier to do that. And you can hide and you you can say, I've been hurt. I don't want to be hurt again. And you can have a million reasons why you do that, but they're all wrong. And God has called you to engage and to do this. And the thing you're afraid of is the thing that verse 9 is talking about, people slandering and reviling and hurting you. And there's a better way than hiding, and there's a better way than running. I like it. Why do you think families fight more than they do in their friend groups? I like, I'm going to, maybe teenagers. I like to, teenagers, you're just easy targets. I'm sorry. <coughs> you, you come in your homes and you blow up at everything. You know, anything mom or dad or your siblings do, you just blow up. You, you, you say things you wouldn't say, but with your friends, they can do anything to you, and you laugh and you shrug it off. Why is that? In a family, we see each other and we spend most of our time and we have the most opportunity to hurt each other. 
Uh, I, I love the, the guy who said to me, he said, you know, how, how can my wife say that I'm not loving? Every, every one of my friends say I am. Well, do you treat every one of your friends the way you treat your wife? The answer is no. And so there's something different going on here. And, and you remember that quote I used from Ephesians, no one is a hero to their limousine driver? Because the limousine driver sees what you're like when no one else is watching, when you get in and everything else you do. And so they, they see it. And in the body of Christ, that's going to start happening if it functions rightly. So if we're going to do verse 8 and really be sympathetic and brotherly and open our hearts up to one another, if we obey God and just quit coming to church and going home and give ourselves to this body which God has commanded, what is our greatest danger then is us? And the danger is how do we deal with the hurt and being mistreated or maybe even slandered? How do I deal with that? That's what Peter's going to take up in verse 9. I want to give you an answer for that. In verse 9, we'll start in verse 8. Sum up, be harmonious and sympathetic and brotherly and kind-hearted and be humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And so we've been looking at this through this whole section, and so I don't want to really get bogged down in too much of the details here, but get the flavor of it. If you understand that we, we might actually start to live this way. This is a, a, a little key in the verse that I, I think has opened up my heart, and I'm starting to see a lot of fruit in this area, and it's, it's just not the idea uh, when no one is treating me this way. Not returning evil for evil. The word means to pay back. To don't give evil back to the one who gives you evil. And the natural response since the fall in the garden, if someone gives you evil, you give evil back. You do tit for tat. An unkind word, you snap back at someone, and, and it's, it's in the context of marriage. This whole verse from 1 through 7 of Peter happens so often in that context. Don't give insult for insult. We don't use the words, our words like a whip. You insult me, I'm going to just throw it right back at you. Strike me with your words and I'll strike you back. Someone's got to break the cycle. And what we're going to look at this morning is countercultural, and, and you'll be called a wimp if you do it. But it takes more courage to respond the way that Peter's going to call us to in this text than not. And this was Jesus' message. In Matthew, he said, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn them the other one. If they sue you for your shirt, give them your coat as well. If they ask you to go a mile, go an extra one. I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is the way of the master. This was how he walked. Go back to verse 23 of chapter 2. Jesus Christ, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to the kind of righteousness that we're learning in this passage. For by his wounds you were healed. So I want to labor to unlock this little passage uh, and this truth that I think is really going to help you to, uh, I, I think, to find uh, in Jesus a grace to manifest grace to all. So verse 9, look with it. Look with me in verse 9. There's... There's a textual call that we got to make to answer the question that I think is so important. He says, give a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And there are two schools of thought for how you can interpret this. And there's many in between, but these are the two main ones. Those who insult us, those who treat us as evil, he says, we bless them so that we might inherit a blessing. And so I, I bless them because I, I want to get a blessing. I want to get eternal life. The other view is those who insult us and treat us as evil, we bless them because we've been called to inherit a blessing. So one is so that we might get a blessing, and the other is because we have received a blessing, which I would say the second one is what Peter is talking about. I want you to think of this. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother who sins against you, I won't forgive you. And you could go around saying, okay, I'm going to forgive everyone I can so that Jesus will forgive me on that last day. 
And if I don't forgive you, he's not going to forgive me, so i got to forgive you. You can run around thinking that way, or you can say forgiving others is so linked to your understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ that forgiveness just has to come out of you. And if it doesn't, Christ is saying you've never been forgiven. If you can't just manifest the forgiveness that God has given to you, maybe you've never experienced his forgiveness. And I believe that's what Christ was teaching in the same thing here. Do we run around trying to bless those who insult us? Do we run around, you give me evil, I'm not going to do it. it. It hurts me. I hate you. I hope something bad comes upon you. I hope you get exposed and the whole world sees what you're doing to me. But you know what? I'm, I want to inherit a blessing. So I'm going to bless you. I'm going to, God, bless this evil person that I don't even like who's doing this to me. That is the whole opposite of this passage. Do you think Jesus was hanging on a cross and he's looking at everyone mocking him and reviling him and shaming him. And he thought, you know what? I hate these people, but it, it's right to forgive. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That is not what went on that cross. And I think there's a lot more going on in this passage than that. And I want to get at the heart that Jesus had. Because the other is legalism. The other is hypocrisy. I'm just going to forgive you so that I can get forgiven. I'm just going to bless you so I can get blessed. All that is is a bunch of hypocrisy. And it's the opposite of what we've learned in Peter. You've been born again to agape love. You have an ability to love like God loves. God loving through you. That stuff is hypocrisy. I want love from a pure heart. And I want submission to God in this whole section out of surrender and out of joy. So what I don't want is people reviling me and snubbing me and slandering me and treating me bad, and my heart just wants to revile back, and I insult them to others, if not to their face. But I want something in my heart like Jesus that was real. I want his heart towards those who were doing that to him. It it wasn't just subdued passions. It wasn't just biting your tongue. But it was a heart, it was a heart that loved and forgave. So it's got to be more. It's got to be more than if I do this, I get a blessing. There's got to be more in this passage. And there's so much more that this is a calling to bless others who are treating you this way, and it's the ground. The ground is because you will inherit a blessing. And so, guys, this is big. For our life together, I want you to really get this. If we're ever going to live out verse 8, which I desire so much for every person in this church, that you would find that kind of a spirit and feelings and heart toward one another. What is the point of my life? Uh, I have a calling, he says, to bless people. And so I have a calling to do verse 8. I have a calling to engage my life and, and bless people people, to bless those who are easy and to bless those who are very difficult. I have a calling, every one of you have a calling to bless those who really like you and those who really don't like you, to those who speak well of you and to those who slander you and say all kinds of evil about you. I have a calling for for those who get you and those who don't get you. For those who are edifying and for those who are toxic, I have a calling to to bless all of those kind of people. For those who are cuddly and those who are bristly, I have a calling from God to bless people. This is your calling. How can I use my life to bless people? Verse 10 through 12, that's the good life. The good life is I want to use my days, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I want to bless people with this body, with these lips, with this heart, hands, and feet. You want to find life? You want to find meaning? Then die to yourself and give yourself to be a blessing to others, especially those who mistreat you, who are something, that is something so beautiful and freeing if you could lay hold of that this morning. I just want to bless, and especially those who mistreat me. I want to come after it. I want to hunt it down. It's, just br- it's freeing. When I started Southside Bible Church, I had a brother in Christ who was really abusing me and slandering me and saying all kinds of evil about me behind closed doors and sometimes even in a pulpit. 
and it was hurting me so deeply, and I was losing sleep, and I, I just felt weighted down. And I began to feel even a little bitterness growing in my heart. And then I was reading through the Sermon on the Mount, and it said, pray for those who mistreat you, and, and began praying for the man's blessing, a, a blessing, God, would you bless this man? And I prayed it from absolute sincerity of my heart, and it just all fell off, and all of a sudden what started springing up was verse 8, brotherliness and sympathy. The freedom that came from that, the, the joy was so real and deep, and I can just tell you that's the good life. That is the good life. The joy of being right with God and walking with Him and not taking on all these burdens and giving them to God and responding like Jesus Christ to those who come against you, that is the good life. But catch this connection. I'm going to give you, guys, wake up. You lost an hour of sleep. I feel terrible for you. And my, my spiritual gift is to kind of, uh, I don't know, bring you, bring you back to sleep, but... Uh, someone said they just got back from the Shepherds Conference and how good it was, and I thought, my spiritual gift is to bring you back to earth and remind you. So this, this is beautiful. Verse 9, you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. The blessing that Peter has labored for in this epistle for us to understand. You remember how he began the epistle? That you have been born again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So you were dead, and God has caused you to be born again. He spoke, and He gave you life, and He gave you life now with a living hope. The world has a dead hope. Everything in the world's hopes are going to die. They're dying or they will die. And we have this living hope in the one who's been resurrected, accomplished salvation. Guys, this is what you are as a believer. You are born again. You have a living hope in Jesus Christ. And then we came to verse 13 of chapter 1, and he says, therefore, we are to hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So now as believers, he's saying, hope, set your hope on the day that Jesus Christ is coming back. That is the, the, the hope of the believer. I've been born again to a living hope, and my life now is setting my hope on that day that Jesus Christ comes back. That's our hope. What is coming at the revelation of Jesus Christ? It is so good what's going to happen and what's coming for us when Jesus comes back. That now, that now, because of that, you don't return evil for evil. When Jesus comes, catch this, he will not return evil for evil to you, child of God. All of my evil... All of my evil that I have done to Jesus Christ for so many years in blindness and now even with light that I still do, he's not going to come back and return all the evil that I have done to him. He will not come back and repay evil with evil to me. But on that blessed day, Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's going to bless me with all that God can bestow upon created beings. Nothing will be held back from the heart of God. He will dispense every grace and mercy that he can put upon us. That's what he's going to give to us when he comes back. Do you, can you imagine and fathom what Jesus Christ is going to give to you when he comes back? He's not going to return evil for evil. The joy and the hope of the believer is he's going to come and he's going to bless me with blessings unimaginable for all of eternity. Enter into the joy of your master. So guys, you can't hope in this and now turn around and return evil for evil and insult for insult. You can't do that. He's going to come and I should have got evil for my evil. And he's going to give me blessing upon blessing and now I'm going to go choke the guy who mistreats me. This is the heart of the whole gospel. This truth could be the end of such a life. If you've been just ham just your whole life, you, you've, you've been clinging to returning evil for evil and fighting and arguing with everybody, I, I'm praying for you this morning that God might set you free by this beautiful truth that you've been called to inherit a blessing on that last day when Jesus Christ returns. This is the good life. To live with the five graces of verse 8. To really give yourself to the body of Christ and love it 
and, and get, open your heart up and get in each other's lives and care about each other like no one else. And then when you get wronged, you don't return evil for evil. You don't revile in return. But you just want to be a blessing to this church and to this world. I just want to give my life to bless others. That's my existence. Because on the last day, I'm going to be so amazingly blessed by Jesus Christ on that day. He's not going to return evil for evil to me. But rather, all of my evil that I did to him and all my evil that I did against him, guys, I can run so many things through my head of what I did. And on that day, I'm going to receive grace upon grace. And when I've been there 10,000 years, I'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when I first begun. What motivation to bless and not retaliate and lash out and give cold shoulders and all of the like. So that we could be of one mind because we have a greater cause than our own little world. But the cause to lift high the cross of Jesus Christ and that name that is above every name that we would be in unity and we would forbear with each other's differences. I love what Paul said, let your forbearing spirit be known by all men. What we're to be known by, by all men, is the way we forbear. And I pray that as we, we show that, this whole epistle, is if you start doing that, people are going to start asking you, what's the hope within you? They're going to start saying, what's going on in this church? I want to know the God that you guys know. When this starts coming out, it's revival. And so I pray that the name of Jesus Christ would be more important than your own agendas and your own hurts. And that, that we would be focusing on the blessing that's coming when Jesus Christ returns. That's my blessed hope. And I'm going to think about it. I'm going to fix my eyes on it. I'm going to live every day for that day when he comes. And he's going to give me blessing and not reviling and evil that, that I deserve on that last day. To God be the glory. Amen. What a gospel. Father, I thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you we've been born again to a hope that cannot die. I thank you, Lord, that as a, a group of believers, we are like-minded on the return of Jesus Christ to make all things right, to throw down evil and to reward righteousness and Him to be the center of worship for all of eternity. God, we thank you for this hope, and I pray that it would set hearts free who are reviling and, and returning evil with evil and slandering and joining in at work, hurting people and family members and spouses. God, would you bring repentance to this body this morning? Would we look at the glories and the beauties of Jesus Christ? Would we marvel that there is a God who is not going to return evil for evil when he returns to us? God, what you're going to give us, we don't deserve. It's all of grace, so we worship you and we marvel you. It's from you, it's through you, and it's to you. To God be the glory forever, amen. And I pray, Lord, that people would just lay this down, that hearts would be set free that we would begin praying for those who persecute us, returning love and kindness and submission to authorities that mistreat us and malign us and hurt us. God, I pray that we could grow to the place of walking to a cross and being crucified upside down for the name of Jesus Christ. Give us a glad submission to the living God in all areas of our life. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious and beautiful name that we do pray. And all God's people said.